Welcome to NVC Life. I'm Rochelle Lamb, veteran NVC trainer and relationship coach, helping listeners navigate interpersonal conflict and ground more deeply into relational living. Greetings, fellow humans. This week's episode is on transforming enemy images. I'm going to jump right in with an excerpt from Marshall Rosenberg's book, Speak Peace in a World of Conflict, which is a source from the book publisher's website, Puddle Dancer Press. Please be sure to click on the link in the show notes. Here we go. To create the world that exemplifies our values, we need to liberate ourselves from enemy images. The thinking that says there is something wrong with the people whose actions or values we don't agree with. Whether our enemy images are with politicians, individuals with religious convictions different from our own, leaders of the corporate world, or our neighbors next door, lasting social change isn't possible until we learn how to transform these enemy images. Now, that's not easy to do. Why? Because it's hard to believe that those who are doing things far outside of our value system are human beings like the rest of us. It's very challenging. Let me give you an example. I was visiting Fargo, North Dakota to do some training in the schools. I wasn't there to facilitate a mediation. Somebody who had helped us get into the schools asked me a personal favor. She said, you know, Marshall, in my family, we're having a big conflict about my father's retirement. He wants to retire, but there's tremendous conflict in the family between my two brothers and how my father wants to divide up our large farm. We've even been in the courts trying to solve this. It's horrible. I could arrange your schedule so you could have a long lunch of two and a half hours. Would you be willing to mediate? I said, you say it's been going on for months? She said, actually, years. And I know it's over lunchtime, Marshall, but whatever you could do to help, I would really appreciate it. So I went into the room that day with the father and the brothers. Incidentally, the father lived in the middle of the farm and each son lived on one end. The brothers hadn't spoken to each other in eight years. I asked the usual question to the brothers. Could you tell me what your needs are? The younger brother suddenly screamed at his older brother. You know, you've never been fair to me. You and dad only care about each other. You've never cared about me. Then the older brother said, Well, you never did the work. And so there they were yelling at each other for about two minutes. I didn't need to hear more about the background. In that short amount of time, I could guess what each side's needs were that weren't being addressed or understood. Because I was pressured for time, I said to the older brother, Excuse me, could I play your role for a moment? He looked a little puzzled, but he shrugged and said, Go ahead. So I played his role as though he had nonviolent communication skills. I was able to hear behind the younger brother's judgmental way of expressing himself what his needs were that weren't met. And I'd heard enough of the older brother's needs by then to express his needs in a different way. And we made a lot of progress in helping the brothers see each other's needs. However, the two and a half hours were up and I had to go back and do my workshop. The next morning, the father, who, as I noted, had been sitting in on the session, came to where I was working with the teachers. He was waiting for me out in the hall. He had tears in his eyes and he said, Thank you so much for what you did yesterday. We all went out to dinner last night for the first time in eight years, and we resolved the conflict over dinner. See? Once both sides get over the enemy image and recognize each other's needs, it's amazing how the next part, which is looking for strategies to meet everyone's needs, becomes pretty easy by comparison. It's getting past the enemy images. That's the hard work. It's getting people to see that you can't benefit at other people's expenses. Once you have that clear, Even complicated things like family squabbles aren't horrible to resolve because you've got people connecting at a human level. The same applies to any situation where you have seemingly opposing values. 
the most common elements I've found in the conflicts I've been asked to mediate are that people, instead of knowing how to say clearly what their needs and requests are, are quite eloquent in diagnosing other people's pathology, what's wrong with them for behaving as they do. Whether it's two individuals, two groups, or two countries that have conflicts, they begin the discussion with enemy images, telling the other person what's wrong with them. The divorce courts and the bombs are never far away. And that's the end of the excerpt. So what we have here is a concrete example of NVC at work. Marshall steps in, taking on the role of the older brother, and is able to pretty quickly get to the place of being able to identify the needs, which is what eventually leads to people being able to hear each other and connect. In this particular example, a reconciliation takes place. And as most people know, things don't always turn out so favorably. Sometimes conflict reaches an intractable stage. One or more parties flatly refuse to come to the table. I never want to hear from you again, ever. You want to talk to me? Talk to my lawyer. In that case, the application of NVC becomes more of a meditation or spiritual practice in the absence of the other person. To return to what Marshall says, getting past the enemy image is the hard work. A deeply strained or estranged relationship isn't necessarily the end of the relationship. One could say that it continues to live in the same way that relationships endure after the death of a loved one, and that any relationship that has become mired in resentment, mistrust, and hostility will give us plenty to work on within ourselves when it comes to enemy images, especially because we will likely feel justified in maintaining the enemy image. The person doesn't deserve to live well. They don't deserve to be treated fairly. They should be punished. It's hard to maintain any sense of goodwill once we start generating enemy images. The real test, then, is to see if you can appreciate the needs that the other person might have been attempting to satisfy, even if those attempts were poorly executed and you were hurt. It's been my experience that in many instances, both parties share the very same needs. Can you guess what those are? Typically, the need to be fully heard, the need for respect for one's perspective, the need for trust, and the need for empathy. That's usually it. And it's so hard to attend to those needs in another person if we are also wanting those same needs to be met in ourselves at the same time. Two under-resourced people needing empathy from each other. That's where the presence of another person or a mediator comes in very handy. That person can hopefully empathize with both persons, identify the needs, and clear a pathway for connection. So what's the process for transforming enemy images? Remember that all judgments are tragic expressions of unmet needs. If you think someone is selfish and manipulative, you're generating an enemy image of the person. So step one is to identify the judgment. Step two is to identify the underlying needs behind selfish and manipulative. I would say in the case of selfish, we're talking about the needs for respect and consideration for others. And in the case of manipulation, we're talking about trust and respect for one's personal autonomy and other possible needs. You would then identify the needs that the other person is attempting to meet in doing what they're doing the behavior that doesn't meet your needs. Maybe they've hidden an expensive purchase from you that they know you wouldn't approve of and that you had agreed to consult with each other about large purchases. What's their need in keeping the information from you? How about the need for self-protection, for acceptance, respect for their autonomy? Now, this doesn't justify their behavior, but it does explain it. We all share those same needs, but in this case, the needs for trust, honesty, and transparency have taken a hit. At least you have a place to start the conversation from, though. Anchoring your conversation in needs language is infinitely better than launching into a tirade about how this person is an untrustworthy scumbag. Yes, transforming enemy images is hard work, but to give ourselves over to that work is what deepens us 
as humans, work without which we usually only end up descending into inhumanity. An eye for an eye only ends up making the whole world blind, as Mahatma Gandhi said. Now, before I make it sound like all a person has to do is connect to underlying needs to transform enemy images, I'd like to read a page from a book by therapist John Wellwood. The book is Perfect Love, Imperfect Relationships, Healing the Wound of the Heart. So to preface the excerpt, Wellwood shares how in one of his workshops time is given to exploring grievances. And after an exercise, he asks participants, now that we've looked at the painful and destructive consequences of grievance, I'd like you to check something else out. See if you are willing to let go of your grievance. And please be honest, who's willing to do that now? There was silence. Not a single person raised their hand. He says, good. Thank you for your honesty. Before we can find a way to let our grievances go, it's essential to acknowledge how attached we are to them. We need to understand our whole investment in grievance and see exactly why we hold on to it so tightly. Wellwood then asks participants to pair up and write down what was good about holding on to grievance. Here is a list of what people came up with. Holding on to my grievance gives me a sense of power, which protects me from feeling vulnerable. It's a way of standing up for myself and defending myself from being hurt, disappointed, or rejected again. It keeps me vigilant against recurrences of harm. Holding on to a grudge lets me feel right and righteous. It's as if I have my own private jihad. Giving it up would be a way of letting the people who hurt me off the hook and letting them walk all over me. Grievance bolsters a familiar sense of me. I know myself in this place. It gives me a sense of identity. Even though it doesn't actually feel good, I'd rather live with this familiar discomfort than let the grievance go and feel the discomfort of stepping into the unknown. Letting it go would undermine my whole identity. It's a way of saying poor me and feeling sorry for myself, so it becomes a way of trying to get some sympathy. It's a cry for help. Holding on to a grievance is a way of taking care of myself, of soothing myself by shifting my attention away from the wound. In this sense, it's self-affirming. It's a way of bonding with the members of my family who all harbor some complaint against the world. My family were immigrants who were mistreated in Europe for many generations and again when they first arrived in America. Voicing our grievances is a way of licking our wounds together. Being victims together is a membership card in the family. It provides an organizing principle, a unifying story about exploitation, oppression, haves versus have-nots, and fighting to get what you need, which gives me a worldview, a sense of what I need to fight for. This provides a sense of order and purpose in the midst of chaos. My grievance is bound up with feelings of being abandoned by my father, who left our family when I was young. Oddly enough, Holding on to it helps me maintain some emotional connection with him. I can see how my anger and resentment are a way of trying to hold on to him. Shifting the blame onto others allows me not to have to take responsibility for my own problems. That's the end of the list. And then he goes on to say, no wonder it's so hard to let go of grievance and forgive. These statements show the powerful functions it can serve in the psyche. If we have a grievance ready at hand, it can protect us from feeling vulnerable. We can avoid putting ourselves in situations like the one that originally hurt us. Hardening around grievance gives us a certain righteous strength. I'll show you that you can't mess with me. I'll show you I'm someone to be reckoned with. It seems to provide a place to stand. I'm going to conclude the episode here. As we already know, thinking in terms of enemy images and grievances is incredibly destructive, and yet transforming those enemy images and grievances is no easy task. It requires an ongoing commitment to deeply examine long-held habits and beliefs. 
It requires a level of honesty and self-inquiry that very often reveals things about us that we'd rather not know. But it's the work we need to undertake if we want to build and maintain strong and healthy relationships. Thank you for tuning into NBC Life. For future episodes, be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube. For free resources or to book a private session with me, head over to rochellelam.com. Until the next time, stay sane, grateful, and generous. Thank you.